Hi, everybody. Welcome back to part two. Uh, and we should wrap it up here within the next 10 minutes or so. Um, so we were talking about defining the role, uh, defining the war on terrorism. And we highlighted the fact that shortly after the attacks of 9-11 uh, in 2001, uh, President George W. Bush addressed the nation, stating that America and its allies were, at, were in a war with terrorism. Uh, and then more recently, uh, President Barack Obama has redefined America's approach to terrorism as a criminal justice problem where military force is used to augment uh, legitimate, to augment legal power. Now, there are a couple of different viewpoints on um, whether or not it's an, this whole idea of using the metaphor uh, for war on terrorism. Now, as we just got done talking about, some officials in the United States have defined terrorism by uh, rhetorically declaring war on it. And we already talked about the fact that there is no constitutional provision for declaring war on a concept. Although it is not the first time we declared war on a concept. We've declared war on drugs. We've declared war on gangs. Um, and so that metaphor of war has been used in other aspects of um, uh, our public policy as, as a means to uh, get public awareness about a particular situation. Uh, so again, whether it's a war on drugs, uh, war on terrorism, war on gangs, the metaphor war is something that has been used in other times and places. Now, many individuals accept the idea of a war on terrorism as legitimate. Um, our textbook talks about a couple of these, and I'll highlight what they have to say. Uh, Thomas Friedman believes that, the, that democracy's third great struggle against totalitarianism, totalitarianism in the past 100 years is this act of, is this concept of terrorism. So he talks about the Nazis from 1939 to 1945, the Cold War from 1945 to 1991, and now militant groups who despise America. And that's what we're dealing with in the present day. Uh, Stephen Blank, uh, his belief is that terrorism can be countered by providing military assistance to legitimate governments and pressuring repressive governments to reform. So using that influence of our government through its military to get legitimate governments to help seek their assistance uh, and then obviously also pressuring repressive governments to reform, change their ways in, in trying to deal with this issue of uh, globalized terrorism. Uh, recently, as of today in the news, um, President Trump had tweeted about Pakistan and um, that they have been less than helpful in terms of uh, their efforts on curbing terrorism. Um, and so now that's going to be part of the news here for, for a while. Uh, and we'll see what any, if any political backlash there might be to that in and of itself. Uh, Ariel Cohen believes the United States must project military power in the face of terrorist threats, arguing that it is necessary to position military forces in Central Asia so that they can be used in Afghanistan and elsewhere. And Fiona Hill believes it is, it is necessary to identify militant groups and select the proper tactics that will destroy them. So identifying those groups, identifying those leaders, uh, and taking steps to destroy them, um, that has been, been taking place, obviously, especially with the use of drone strikes uh, in other, other parts of the world as a means to um, assassinate, if you will, um, uh, terrorist leaders or people that are part of a terrorist organization. Um, that has come under some, some debate because some of these uh, drone strikes have been against US citizens who have become um, uh, terrorists themselves. And the question often becomes whether or not there's, since they're American citizens, whether they're entitled to some level of due process. Uh, but that's for something to discuss later on uh, in, our, in our class discussion, okay? Um, but there are also, but there are 
others who do not accept the war on terrorism, um, and these are guys are highlighted in our textbook. Uh, Michael Howard, for one, believes that terrorism is an emergency situation best handled by intelligence and law enforcement services and not necessarily military services. Uh, some scholars argue that the language of war has been used to manipulate public response and increase anxiety. So think about that. I mean, obviously, that's a very powerful word, and I've talked about it just a little bit ago. We have a war on drugs. Is that an appropriate term to use, war on drugs? What does war mean? You know, if you're a law enforcement officer and, and your mayor or your chief says there's a war on drugs, there's a war on prostitution, does that mean, you know, you take your gloves off and and deal with the problems? Uh, do you um, engage in questionable tactics as a means to remove a problem from society? Um, that whole metaphor of war can be very troubling to some. Um, and so again, some scholars believe that the language of war has been used to manipulate public response and increase anxiety. So think about that. I mean, when you talk about politicians that are mentioning the war on terrorism, uh, think about how that makes you feel, or maybe has that word over time sort of diminished in terms of its influence uh, and, and power. Alfred McCoy believes utilizing military methods from the intelligence community is detrimental to the effectiveness of anti-terrorist operations. And Eric Ringmar believes that throughout U.S. history, the U.S. has fought two types of wars. He says there are civilized wars against other nations that generally fight within the same rules as America. And then we have small wars against what he terms savages, which obviously could be considered terrorist groups. Um, so I think it's important just to understand that this whole metaphor of war um, creates a situation as to whether or not our response to domestic terrorism, in other words, ter terrorism that's occurring on U.S. soil, um, is better approached from a military perspective or a criminal justice perspective. Um, and, you know, military perspective deals with issues such as Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, where, you know, there are still individuals there who are suspected terrorists. Uh, versus bringing them to trial in the criminal courts here in the United States, in other words, through the criminal justice process. So that is probably going to continue to be an ongoing debate. Maybe not so much now since you have a Republican president, but, you know, it, it seems to fluctuate back and forth depending on, uh, you know, who's sitting in the White House. And so whether it's military force or criminal justice, just understand that there are two approaches um, to dealing with uh, terrorism and our response to terrorism. Now, again, sometimes military force can augment criminal justice in the sense that, um, you know, intelligence information may have been obtained following the terrorist attacks in the States that leads to some outpost in some other country in which military force might be used to eradicate that outpost or those individuals involved in some level of terrorist activity, or if there's a connection to that activity here in the United States. But understand that this whole concept of metaphor of war and the whole military force versus criminal justice and, and the approach to addressing acts of terrorism. Uh, so again, one of the things you're dealing with this week is, is this whole metaphor of war on terrorism. What does it mean to you? Um, and so it gives you something to think about. What does it mean to you? Um, what are the implications of war? And is, the, that, is this the best approach to take for our country, to consider a war on terrorism uh, instead of some other aspect or some other uh, legal uh, maneuverings to uh, address terrorism here in the United States and, and elsewhere? Okay? So as you go through your textbook, that's going to be on about pages 19, and it's probably going to take you, um, you know, you can go all the way through probably towards the end of the text, um, or at least through up to about page 27. Yeah, you can take a look at this whole concept of uh, war on terrorism and the military force versus criminal justice. Now, 
the last thing I have on this particular page is the Christmas Day suicide bomber in the Constitution. And I bring this up only because um, it can serve as an example as to how constitutional rights might be suspended and whether or not that is um, something that a, as a democratic society, a democracy, is that something we want. So just to reflect, just to go back and, and help you um, understand what took place here, uh, back on our Christmas Day in 2009, a suicide bomber unsuccessfully tried to blow up a Northwest airliner just before it landed in Detroit. Passengers subdued the suspect and the FBI took him into custody. As required by law, before questioning a suspect while in law enforcement custody, the FBI advised the suspect of his rights under the U.S. Constitution. In the days following the incident, former Vice President Richard Cheney and a host of Republicans lambasted the Obama administration for being soft on terrorism. Their argument was that the U.S. Constitution did not apply to terrorists. This dispute becomes an illustration of Ringmar's thesis, and we already talked about Ringmar. Will the United States follow Ringmar's interpretation of history and revert to the utter destruction of savages within the metaphor of war? So terrorists are savages. Savages are uh, not subject to the benefit of the U.S. Constitution. Uh, and not only that is, we're also dealing with it under the war metaphor. Ironically, many American military thinkers do not believe that this is the correct move. They argue that it is neither necessary to define terrorism nor to use a war on terrorism metaphor. They believe that it's time to change the American way of war. So what do you think? I mean, do we need to change our approach and how we define terrorism, uh, the use of the war metaphor, our approach to, to dealing with terrorism versus from a military's perspective or from a criminal justice perspective. Okay, so again, you can take a look at that. Um, again, that's that's in the textbook and it's uh, I have the pages for you. Uh, some closing thoughts. Uh, think about a recent incident or incidents of terrorism based on the definitions offered by our textbook. How do these incidents fit our definitions? So you can go back and look at this is the incident from Manhattan where the guy rented a Home Depot truck and ran down and killed several pedestrians in Manhattan, uh, got out of his car. There was some evidence to link the individual to um, ISIS. And so the question you know, became, was this an act of terrorism? And um, you know, just something that you can read, in, uh, read upon more if you want, or even do it as part of your paper assignment. But think about these, these acts that you hear about. And based on the definitions, you know, consider whether or not you think these things apply, whether or not this is fit the description as an act of terrorism. So finally, we're going to look at, you know, in terms of terrorism is whether or not um, this definition is, is there confusion in trying to define terrorism? And you can use it from a couple of different perspectives, but understand that terrorism is defined again by different people within different social and political realities. The definition of social construct changes with the social reality of the group providing the definition. Groups construct a framework around a concept, defining various aspects of the lives through the meanings they attribute to the construct. Meaning of terrorism changes within social and historical context. The meaning of terrorism has changed over time. And hopefully when you look at those 25 examples of terrorism in history, you might be able to see where uh, the meaning of terrorism might have changed over time. And then this week, uh, I just wanted to highlight what your, what your assignments are. Uh, the writing assignment this week is how has terrorism impacted your life? And I really want you to give this some thought because obviously, unless you've been impacted or have lived through a significant event, you may say terrorism now, this whole idea of terrorism has not impacted my life. Uh, but think about it. I mean, people are more conscious now about standing around idly in large groups. So airport terminals, for example. I mean, even I become, you know, I don't want to stand around way too long in a high-profile area such as an airport. 
uh, picking up baggage, for example. I mean, there's just a bunch of people down there looking. So think about that this week, uh, and I'll talk to you later.